Hello, everyone, and welcome to SIA's Everything You Wanted to Know About Storage But Were Too Proud to Ask webinar series. Today, you're going to be treated to part MOVE, a webinar specifically focusing on storage networking concepts. My name is Jay Metz, and I will be uh, your host today, and I'm joined by Dror Goldenberg, VP of Software Architecture at Mellanox. And I'm also joined by Chad Hintz, a Principal Systems Engineer with Cisco and a SNEA Ethernet Storage Forum board member, and Fred Knight, a Standards Technologist at NetApp. Today, these gentlemen have volunteered to be your gurus for all things storage. Now, in case you're new to SNEA, we are an industry association that represents 160 unique member companies, and we have over 3,500 3, active contributing members that reach a community of over 50,000 IT end users and storage professionals worldwide. Now, before we get started on, a, uh, on today's webinar, here's a little bit of administrative. First, if you find yourself having problems with the audio cutting out, we found that this is often an issue with various browser caches. So emptying the cache or reloading the browser often helps. Second, the information contained in this presentation is copyright by SNEA, and any member company and individual members may use this material in presentations and literature as long as the slides are not modified and SNEA is acknowledged as the source. Of course, even though we do the best we can to be as accurate as possible, you are encouraged to use this wisdom and scintillating brilliance at your own risk. One final bit of information, please feel free to use the question button at the top of the screen to ask anything you like during the course of the presentation. We will do our time allotted. And also, please do not forget to rate the presentation. Constructive comments are all always appreciated. And so if you have concepts or topics that you'd like to see in the future, that's the best place to put them. And last but not least, this presentation will be available along with the blog that addresses all the questions at a URL that is posted at the end. So, I uh, already talked about SNEA. So let's talk about what we're going to be talking about now that we got the housekeeping out of the way. Now, if this is your first Too Proud to Ask webinar, welcome. You may be wondering why we're doing something like this. Well, as technology improves, we're seeing a lot of cross-pollinization between different areas. So as a result, IT professionals are being asked to pretend they know everything about all IT. And as a result, we often find ourselves in sticky situations. Like, hey, I've been having conversations with people about storage and pretending to know what I'm talking about, but I'm tired of having to fake it till I make it. Don't worry, your secret is safe with us. So this session is going to focus entirely upon different types of interconnections. As you can see, these all fall into the highly generic category called network. But in reality, we're just talking about the mechanisms that connect different components in the data center. We do recommend that you take a look at our first Too Proud to Ask webinar, Part Chartreuse, that goes over many necessary terms for both hosts and storage. So, having said that, off we go. The first section that we're going to tackle is one of the most fundamental misunderstandings in storage. We've heard of fiber channel, we've heard of fiber channel over Ethernet, we've heard of PCIe buses and SCSI buses, but just what is a channel and just what is a bus? Dror is going to fill us in. You ready, Dror? Yes. Okay. Thank you very you? much, Jay, for the thank you very much, Jay, for your introduction. So I'll start with some um, very high level description of bus and channel. And I also put some illustrations so that uh, it would be easier for you guys to remember afterwards. Um, I start from the bus. And a bus is quite simple. It's a set of signals that are connecting different things. They can connect CPUs and they can connect peripherals. It's just a set of signal connecting things. Same thing like the, the picture here of a road connecting different houses or different streets. And it enables that connectivity. Channel is more of a loaded term, um, and it has different meanings in different contexts, and you need to make sure you ask about what kind of context we're talking here. If you look at channels very high level, sometimes channels are physical, and sometimes they are logical, but they all refer to communication line or some communication path between two elements or more. And in this uh, picture below, just to, to look at those motorcycles, 
Um, there is a road and there are motorcycles. Think about those motorcycles as virtual things and you can pack many of them in the same lane or in the same road and they have their own virtual rules and they can do uh, whatever they like. And this is a way of taking a physical resource like the road and carving it into many uh, virtual channels where those motorcycles uh, go. So let's start by looking at the bus. So if you look at the bus, then a bus is basically a communication system that transfers multiple signals simultaneously between different components. Usually within the system, can be between, uh, between the CPUs and peripherals, can be between the peripherals themselves. And the functionality of a bus is divided here into four different categories. There is the control that is a bus or a logical bus that takes care of sending commands. A command can be write data or read data or any other kind of command. There is the data, where is the actual data that, you're being, that is being moved by the bus. It can be the data you want to store. It can be the data that you retrieve. There is the addressing that basically says where that data goes to or where the, that data should be retrieved from. And last is the power. Sometimes you have a bus uh, socket and you want to uh, provide power to the uh, peripheral that is plugged into that uh, bus uh, slot. And, and basically those elements uh, are part of the logical uh, functionality of the bus. Uh, they can be either logical or physical. For example, uh, some of the control signals can be separate wires of the parallel bus. Or if a bus is serial, then those things can be actually encoded into packets that go in that bus. Um, buses can be shared media. Uh, for example, the, the old PCI and PCI-X used to be shared bus where all the cards and, and the, the root complex or must were, uh, were wired together, sharing the same signals. And Today, there is a lot of buses that are point-to-point -point links, basically connecting a switch, uh, moving to a switch element and connecting switch to peripheral, where every uh, line is connecting two points. And also buses can be internal to the system, can be either short cables or, tra or even traces, or they can even go outside of the box, connecting the box to external peripheral uh, for example, storage enclosure, um, uh, SATA or SAS storage enclosure that is out of the box. This slide is actually showing some illustration of a computer system or server architecture uh, just to illustrate the different kind of buses that we see in such a system. So there are different types of buses. There are, there are standard buses and proprietary buses. In this example, you can see the bus that connects the CPU with the DRAM is a standard DDR4 bus. And there are buses that are proprietary. For example, the cache coherency bus between the different CPU sockets is a proprietary bus. There is peripheral bus, which is PC Express. This is a serial bus, and it's a point-to-point -point, uh, link based. So here in the example, you can see PC Express links coming out of the CPU, going to the HBA or going to the NIC. And if you run out of PCI Express buses, then you can use switches. So in the example, you have PC Express switch that kind of enable you to use more PC Express ports. And that connects with PC Express to GPUs or to NVMe drives. You can see here example of shared bus. For example, the SM bus or the I2C uh, that is going out of the chips that enables the connectivity of uh, fan controllers or temperature sensors, they're all shared on the same I2C bus. And there are also storage buses for SATA or SAS, which can also go outside of the box into external storage uh, or SAS enclosures. So in this example, uh, we noted uh, the different uh, buses. Uh, on the, for example, on motherboards, there are PC Express. Sometimes there are traces. Sometimes there are uh, connectors. There are the DDR buses. Storage has SCSI, SATA, or SAS. There are other peripheral buses like USB, Lightning, and so on. 
Things that are not a bus is, for example, Ethernet, fiber channel, InfiniBand. Those are networks and those are fabrics, and they will be discussed later on throughout uh, this webcast. Performance. Performance is some very important characteristics of buses, and every time we move into other generation or have new, newer peripherals, we want to be able to scale with the speed. And there are basically two, two techniques to scale up with the speed. One way to go on a bus is to have a faster data transfer rate on each one of the lanes of the bus. Uh, the very simple example is to go up in the frequency and signal uh, much faster. The other way is also to improve the data per message. Usually those, uh, bu those buses, especially when they are, they are serial, they have special encoding on, on, on the layer one. And one way to improve the efficiency is to come up with better coding that actually enables um, more data to be transferred within the same baud rate. And in the example here, you see a picture of a double-deck bus. Basically, it's, it's a bus, but it can transfer 2x, of 2x the amount of passenger. And that example is kind of like, let's take the, uh, let's take the same thing, but uh, use higher frequency. The other techniques of making buses uh, faster is to work with multiple lanes in parallel. So if you look at the road from the first slide, then you can see it's like a single lane road. And you can definitely put your highway and put as many lanes as you want in that road, and then you get much more bandwidth on the same bus. So those we call lanes. So now we get to channel. And channel is a very loaded term. It can be used in different contexts. It can mean different things, um, which are completely different. And each time you're talking about a bus, make sure that you know the context because things can be complicated. And the first thing that comes in mind into channel is whether it's physical or logical. And, and actually there are both logical and physical channels and I'll give you some examples. If you look at physical uh, channels, they're sometimes referred to as lanes or as buses or part of buses and there actually can be wires or connectors and can be either made of fiber or board trays. One example is when talking about SSD channel or DRAM channels, which basically are physical connectivity to, to either SSD uh, dies or to DRAM, um, DRAM uh, chips on the board. Logical channel can be either a digital TV channel, a VPN link, some kind of uh, frequency allocation in uh, media, or even some other quality of service kind of uh, dividing, uh, um, dividing a link to different virtual channels. And if you want to know how loaded the term is, then even from the mainframe days, a channel subsystem used to be the storage box of the uh, storage system of, of the mainframe. So channel has many meanings, and you should be make sure you know whether you're talking about a logical or a physical channel and then understand the exact context of what you mean by channel. So comparing channel versus a bus, then if you look at the physical stuff, then bus can be comprised of multiple physical channels. In this presentation, we call them lanes to make it easier to, to understand. Uh, but they they could be um, uh, they could be um, uh, interchanged, and if if you look at the logical channels, then you can look at multiple logical channels operating on the same uh, on the same bus or on the same uh, network, kind of giving different quality of service or different uh, uh, different other characteristics to the, the data flowing there. If you look at channel versus lane, then sometimes there are synonym. A channel is a lane, like we did in this. Uh, a webcast, or uh, you can have a channel that has multiple lanes, for example, on the DRAM channel, has multiple wires in it, and so on. So now we start looking beyond the bus, and uh, going towards the network, which will be, network by itself will be discussed uh, in details in the coming uh, other slides, but in general, bus is something that is connecting in a small diameter inside the box, or maybe the box to peripherals, but focusing on 
the same compute system connecting all the, the peripherals to the compute. Network basically goes outside the box, and basically you're going to see typically short distances for bus, longer distances for network, either inside the rack or between racks or even the worldwide internet. internet. Uh, buses are typically, they used to be shared, uh, shared links, but now they are point-to-point -point links and switched. Network is the long time ago it used to be shared. Now all the network for all practical purposes, point-to-point -point links, switch based, very, very efficient. Um, so they are kind of uh, exchanging technology between themselves, picking all the goodies. Um, buses are typically not shared by multiple systems, or actually the network, which is the looks like the road system connecting many cities and many states, they are shared by multiple systems and they are connecting for communication between them. And last, if you look at the addressing, then buses typically have byte or LBA kind of addressing, and we're going to have a special webcast just to discuss that kind of uh, explanation about the addressing and all of that, so stay tuned with us for that webcast. And network typically de de deals with layer two and layer three addressing, and that's what enables the switching and the routing within the network. And obviously, both buses and networks can use multiple channels. Here we have an illustration of a network or a fabric. You'll see soon more details about network and fabric. In this example, it can be either InfiniBand Ethernet or fiber channel, just name it. Set of compute elements, storage elements, all connected together uh, by point-to-point -point links that go to switches, and that enables on the, all the connectivity between them with layer two, layer three other things together. So it's in, if it's even Ethernet, it could be switches or routers. So just to summarize my uh, my section, basically bus versus channel. A bus is a topology of interconnected devices. A channel is a dedicated path for traffic that can sit upon a topology. Groovy. Well, at the moment, we don't actually have uh, any questions so far. If they come in, we can revisit them towards the end of the of the presentation. Um, one question that did come in was whether or not we're going to get a copy of the slides. And yes, you will be able to get a copy of the slides, and there will be a link to where you can actually download those slides at the end of this presentation. In the meantime, next up, we have a control plane versus data plane conversation, which uh, is going to be led by Chad. Chad, you're up. Thanks, Jeff. So, hi, everyone. Now, uh, now we get to talk about control plane and data plane, like Jay mentioned. So, let's go ahead and get started. To note, there is many different variations of control plane and data plane. We're only we're going to talk about three of those today, but the overall goal of the control plane and data plane do not vary that much at a high level. The control plane is the brains or who maps out the plan of what is supposed to happen. The data plane is the movement or the carrying out of that action. From a high level, if you ever get confused on the difference between a control plane and a data plane, always go back to this definition and you'll, you'll usually guide yourself in the right way. So let's get into some of the variations that we have. So the first one we're gonna get into, which is near and dear to my heart, which is network centric. So in a network centric, in a data network, we use the control plane to learn about what network paths are available. Via, via statically entering them in a router or a layer three switch, or learning about them through some type of protocol, such as OSPF or BGP. Now, storage area networks also do this. Storage area networks use a routing protocol, in their case, to be able to learn these different paths, and that routing protocol is FSPF. There's also what we call a management plane. And it's important to understand we're not going to dig deep into the management plane, but it is sometimes confused with the control plane. The management plane is really a subset of the control plane. A uh, management uh, plane is really used on how we access our devices with protocols such as SSH. But it's important to understand that's really a subset of the control plane. So the key point here is that as I purchase more network devices, the more control planes I have. So as as I as I uh, look at that, there's a lot of different talks and a lot of different technologies that have come out 
over the past couple of years to try to figure out how we simplify the amount of control planes. One of those, for instance, is software-defined networking, which has a different couple, a couple of different variations based on the vendor you talk to of how they would solve that problem. But the key point to understand is that a control plane is about learning or mapping out the plan, and then next we're going to talk about what the data plane does. So after we learn the control plane, is it's now on to how do we move that traffic. So what happens is the data plane grabs the information, or its, its job is to act on the plan uh, that moves the traffic from one place to another. So it's taking whatever information it gathers from the control plane, who's, who's basically programming it, and then it's taking that information and it's forwarding that. It's using that to, to forward packets in a network, if we're talking about the network centric. So in a network, that's normally from one interface to another interface, from router to router or layer three switch to layer three switch, and from network to network. So let's get on to our second variation, which is storage centric. So in the storage, we're talking about storage systems. In a storage system, uh, the control plane is again used for learning what we need, the plan, such as what client needs to talk to what disk or LUN and how. And the next piece, the data plane, is to take action on that, like writing to storage or grabbing a read from, from a particular piece of storage. In traditional storage uh, subsystems, just as we talked about with networking devices, as I, as I buy more traditional storage boxes, each one of them is going to have its own control plane to get, and data plane put together into that one unit. So it's important to remember that, that in the traditional manner, the control plane and data plane were put together in one unit. As we start to look forward into where we're going in storage environments, there's been new introductions into, just like we talked about software-defined networking, centralizing some of that uh, control plane. So, and for instance, in a software-defined storage architecture, the data plane is it's separate from the control plane. So we centralize the control plane so we could have many different units that have many different data planes, but their management is all done through the control plane. So let's get into our third variation. In our third variation, we start to look at hyperconverged. So hyperconverged introduces many different control planes. Now these control planes are all doing the same exact thing. It's mapping out the plan of what we want to do, whether that be for storage, for networking, for virtualization, for compute. But in hyperconverged, what we're trying to do is achieve a single control plane for all of that. Okay? So again, it's still mapping, whole control planes and data planes are still, are still there and we, we have them, but what we're starting to look at is how do we centralize that control plane to make it easier from a management standpoint. But going back to what we talked about originally, they still have the same goal. The control plane is mapping out the plan and the data plane is, is taking that plan and putting it into action. But to sum it all up, it's important to remember, like we said in the beginning, and I've said this multiple times already so far, that the control plane is all about creating the plan of what is to happen, and the data plane is using that information from the control plane and applying movement or action to what needs to happen. So we actually did get a really good question <clears throat> that came in. Um, I have my own thoughts about this, but. But Chad, this is up right up your alley. So, um, you think that OpenStack will change the rules of this game? Uh, it possibly could. Yeah. So, obviously, uh, OpenStack does have its own control plane, and it has its own methodology of how it does it. I don't know if we have enough time to get dig deeper into that, but OpenStack has has become some of that centralized control plane for certain things. Um, how it's actually doing that is different than some, some other ways and some different technologies, but uh, OpenStack does actually it does have a big part in that. Yeah, the actual implementation of the control and data plane is a, a really good example of, of uh, how OpenStack can change that. If we do have time at the end of the presentation, I think we should try to revisit it if possible. 
In the meantime, let's go ahead and move on to the fabrics and networks because that will also be relevant to such a discussion. And uh, we'll pass it off to Fred. Thank you, Jay. Good afternoon, evening, or morning, depending on where you are. I'll talk first about the networks. Basically, network is an interconnect that lets a whole bunch of nodes talk to each other. It might be optical connectivity or copper or even wireless connectivity. But you have a bunch of infrastructure, switches, hubs, routers, that are the components, physical components that make up the network. Then you have the protocols, which actually carry the traffic. So obviously, for a network, the Internet is the most famous of those networks, and one that everybody is probably quite familiar with. So we have a picture of a typical network. And you can see the uh, wireless components, uh, the workstations, desktop, desktops, and servers are all connected uh, back through a router out to the Internet. And if we look at two other familiar terms, you'll see that we have our local area portion of that, the part that is within the building, within your office, uh, within the campus, whatever the, the local area component is, and then you have the connection out to the wide area network. So we have the LAN and the WAN. And typically that's going to be a, a piece of hardware called the modem that's going to connect up to whatever is on the outside of your system. So if we look at a fabric, that basically fabrics are networks, but they are a specialized type of network, sort of a subset of networks. Again, it's a bunch of nodes that are connected together, but we have switching components rather than um, having all of the other components. It's primarily switching components. And when these terms were invented, the, the switched fabrics would typically provide higher bandwidth, higher throughput, because of the way that they used the links. They were able to get more parallelism across multiple physical links than the networks based on the early Ethernet. So as we uh, heard already, there are some cases where the different technologies are starting to share some of that, those ideas and share some of that information to make each of the technologies better. So let's look at a fabric. Well, here we have a computer fabric. We have all sorts of, uh, you know, VGA, uh, DB25, you know, all part of this fabric. Of course, we could make curtains or chair coverings or whatever out of this fabric. But that's not the kind of fabric we're talking about. Although, we can get a good lesson from this piece of fabric, and that is by zooming in and looking at how it is made. We can see the components are all tightly coupled, tightly connected, and interwoven with each other. So in fact, here we have an example of what might be called a tight mesh fabric. So everything in this case is interconnected. We have a lot of different kinds of fabric uh, topologies. There are loops and rings with, and uh, hubs and spokes. But the, the mesh fabric is, is partly where this name came from, the idea of the fabric. Fred, can I ask you a quick question? Are you moving forward to the slides, or is my screen just stuck? Oh, I forgot to click the next button. Okay, good. I, I, well, not good, but I mean, I wasn't sure if uh, all of a sudden I had lost something. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for okay, giving me that reminder. We're back so now that we've seen this uh, tight mesh fabric, We'll see what a real uh, computer fabric looks like. In this case, a typical SAN, where we have some host systems on the left, and we have some host systems on the right. We have a set of SAN switches in the middle. Those are all interconnected around uh, the ring there, and they're, they're encircling the storage devices in the center. And so we have all of these interconnected to make our fabric. So in this case, anyone can talk to anyone, as we have with a, with a typical network. But fabrics, that doesn't happen very much. They are interconnected in a way that allows that. But typically, you're going to see the host talking to the storage. 
Storage doesn't talk to storage very much, and hosts don't talk to hosts very much. Now, you do have clusters and things where the hosts do talk to each other, but most of the time they do not use the storage interconnection to do that communication. So that's one of the differences that we'll see between the networks and the fabrics, is that the networks, you will have more what they call east-west communication, different nodes talking to each other, whereas in a storage area network, it is typically mostly north-south communication where you have hosts talking to storage devices. So one important concept to understand is that the network and the fabric are made up of multiple pieces, the physical pieces and the protocol pieces. So we'll look at all of these together here. If we look at an Ethernet fabric, it has the TCP IP protocols, which are used to transfer the information. They can run over copter, over optical, over wireless. And you may have heard the, the terms IEEE 802.3 or 802.11 where 802.3 is talking to the physical wires and 802.11 is talking about the wireless capabilities. Now the TCP IP protocols are, are governed or controlled by the IETF organization. So it is these things that are put together that make the network. Having a piece of wire doesn't do any good. If you're just set up on LinkedIn and you're doing some networking on LinkedIn, but you don't ever log in, you don't ever send a message, you don't ever receive a message, then the fact that you're established there on LinkedIn is pretty useless. You need to have some kind of communication that takes place to actually create the network. So if that's done with dial-up or DSL or broadband, if you're using a cable modem or if you have copper or if you have uh, optics, the Fios equipment right into your house, then it's the same kind of thing. You're going to be running a TCP IP protocol, and there are simply different organizations which control those protocols and define those standards so that everything can talk to everything else. In the case of fiber channel, there is the fiber channel protocol. So you see with uh, the Ethernet networks, with the dial-up networks, we have different names that we call the network type and the protocol type. In the case of Fiber Channel, they decided to give the wire and the protocol the same name. So sometimes it can be confusing when you're talking about Fiber Channel as to whether you're talking about a piece of physical wire or whether you're talking about the protocol that runs over that wire. In the case of InfiniBand, then you have the IB or the InfiniBand protocol. So it's also important to note that this slide is really slimmed down. In the protocol column, you see a little footnote there about running email protocols, HTTP protocols, iSCSI, DHCP, DNS. Those are all different protocols that run on top of TCP IP. There are also protocols that run parallel to TCP IP. The, such as the FCOE protocol or the ROCKE protocol, R-O-C-E. Those are protocols that you can run over networks that create a something that looks more like a, a storage fabric, enabling the protocols to be layered. In addition, both Fiber Channel and InfiniBand have the ability to run the TCP IP protocol on top of their lower layers. So just about any of these physical wires can carry almost any of the protocols, but it is a combination of the physical wire and the protocol that makes the network or that makes the fabric. It's all of the pieces put together that make the whole environment work. So here's a case where we have a blending or a merging of the two terms, the two concepts where we have a, a SAN on the left side, which is we'll call domain one, and a SAN over on the uh, right side called domain two, and we've used a network, uh, an Ethernet network, a TCP IP network to bridge the two, to connect the two, so that we can get some additional distance. Because one of the things that we'll, we'll see is that fabrics, specifically uh, fiber channel Infini and InfiniBand, typically cover smaller distances than networks do. Networks, as we see, can see in the World Wide Web, can cover the whole world. We can have communication from Australia to North America, back to China, anywhere in the world. 
whereas with fabrics, the fabrics tend to be more localized. So generally speaking, networks are thought of as larger entities and fabrics thought of as smaller entities, but those entities for fabrics being much more specialized. We've seen the terms the local area network and the wide area network. We also have the term storage area network, and some people use the term ISAN when they're talking about iSCSI storage area networks. And those are slightly differentiated because those are a protocol running on top of TCP IP. So generally, Ethernet is a more loosely coupled network. The network switches generally have less knowledge. You have lots of endpoints that very often talk to each other. The routing information, there's a number of different routing protocols. I've listed a bunch of them there. And it uses a destination-based flow control. It creates back pressure to tell someone who is trying to initiate a conversation to please slow down or to stop the conversation for a period of time. So there are some issues around that kind of flow control, that it can create back pressure in the network, that you can end up with packets that get dropped because the receiver simply has not got the ability to listen to that packet at that point in time. But there are higher layers of protocol within the the network protocol stack, which correct for that, sometimes through retent transmission, sometimes through other mechanisms. So in fiber channel, it's much more tightly coupled. If we look at that specific type of fabric, the switches have more knowledge. For example, an endpoint in fiber channel knows or has the ability to know when any of the entities that it can talk to, when any of the other endpoints that it's capable of talking to goes away, then the endpoint can find out about it. Whereas with Ethernet topologies and TCP IP networks, if some website goes down on the other side of the world, you don't ever find out about it until you try to talk to it. So there's a difference there in some of that loose coupling versus type coupling. So the knowledge of routing is more distributed each switch is more aware of the routing. It uses a variant of the OSPF routing, and it's called FSPF. And it uses a source-based flow control. The transmitters are not allowed to transmit until they know that the receiver is ready to receive the data. So they have a credit-based mechanism. So that creates an environment that is virtually lossless. Now, I want to point out that there's a lot of confusion about the word lossless. Lossless does not mean that there is no loss. What it means is that there is less loss. Loss can still occur. You can still have sunspots, create bit errors that cause a packet to get lost. You can still have those kinds of events that happen. So to sum it up, networks are a series of interconnected devices and can be put together in multiple topologies, generally loosely connected. And fabrics, they are a type of network. It's important to know that they are still networks, but they have more tight coupling, more distributed intelligence across all of the devices. Well, I have to say, Fred, you've gotten an awful lot of questions. Well, you got a few questions anyway that are, uh, are are pretty relevant, and I'd like to stick with this for just a little bit longer because I think that it's uh, fresh in everybody's mind. Um, the the first question that uh, comes up is uh, about the very difference that you were just talking about, and that question is um, that uh, we've heard that, that networks are used stateless protocols, and would fiber channels therefore do the same? Um, hmm. I, there are multiple pieces within the fiber channel protocol. Um, there are login sequences, and as, so that sort of creates a, a, a stateful connection between, you know, the, the initiator of the connection and the termination point of the connection. Uh, but in terms of data transfers, um, the the data just flows. There, there's no connection. There, there's no state that goes uh, through that through that protocol. So it it really depends exactly on which piece of the fiber channel protocol you're talking about. 
Well, I think really, that if it, it comes down to exactly what we've been talking about with the control plane versus the data plane, right? So the control plane winds up being stateful, but the data plane does not. Yes, I, that's probably accurate. Yeah. So I, I think this is an excellent example of, of, of how these different terms actually do interconnect or intersect and, and can often cause some confusion. Because we, sometimes when we are talking about a protocol versus a medium, uh, this can get lost uh, versus, you know, how we manage the different protocols uh, versus to actually deliver the data. So uh, that was an excellent question. I think that that, it, that came together really nicely. Another question that came up, though, uh, regarding your, your conversation about networking, uh, especially when we were talking about the, the various protocols that sit on top of the, the medium itself, where do SIFS and SMB come into the picture with regards to uh, that particular discussion? Well, they, they have the same kind of thing. They have a control plane. They have a data plane. Uh, they are simply another protocol that's able to, you know, send requests for reading and writing data. And um, I, I, I'm not a SIS expert. Uh, if there is uh, someone else that we have on the call that would like to take a crack at that, then uh, we could have one of our other presenters take a shot at it. Well, I believe the question is really trying to examine specifically where it fits on top of the, the, you know, the TCP protocol, which sits on top of an Ethernet network. And, and this is where the OSI layer comes in handy. Okay, so so that is a topic for a whole new Bright Talk where we where we delve into the to the modeling and the layering of, of networks and what goes on at each layer and how Ethernet has implemented that, how Fiber Channel has implemented it, how uh, InfiniBand has implemented it because they're all just they're all slightly different and um, and, and that would be a topic that we could spend a, a fair amount of time on. Agreed, agreed. But I thought it was a valid question and certainly one that we should uh, address as best we could at this point. Um, other than that, I, uh, we, uh, we do have a couple of other questions, and I'm going to go ahead and, and, and drive as we get into the summary. Uh, Chad, well, you I wanted actually to, have... I wanted to take oh. a, a shot at, at that one simple one we have there about why we have F-I-B-R-E versus F-I-B-E-R. And that okay. is thanks to the international community and the international standardization that happens, which includes the French. And so we often see words that are spelled in a way that makes them happy versus a way that makes the Brits and Americans happy. So that's, that's a thanks uh, to our international uh, partnerships. And, and that's why we have uh, fiber spelled for, uh, for cabling one way and fiber channel spelled in a different way. Yep. Uh, and, Chad, you've got a question, too, uh, that came up, um, yeah. although I have to be honest, uh, it, it's a little difficult to try to parse. So the, it, there's no punctuation here. Um, so with regards to the, the difference of the control plane and the data plane, um, how much do you think it matters in software-defined storage versus traditional switching and storage? So, I, I mean, if I, and I'm reading the question as well, trying to see, see that there, Jay. I, I, I think um, the key part is that no matter if you're, if you're talking about software-defined storage or software-defined networking, in traditional storage and traditional networking, you have to understand the difference between the control plane and data plane. And there's many different reasons for that. So let's take the networking, for instance. So if in a traditional network, I might have many different networking devices. as as was mentioned today during the, the, the talk about how a network is a, it's a compromise of a whole bunch of interconnected devices, it's important to understand what's the difference in, in the actual switch. So I have the control plane, I have the data plane, but what protocols are actually being pushed to the control plane and then what protocols am I using to, to implement the data plane? The reason that's important is because in some cases we might have things, for instance, in a, in a data network where we have a broadcast storm. In a broadcast storm, there's going to be certain protocols inside that are being broadcast. It's not only just data plane traffic. There's also control plane traffic that's being broadcast everywhere. So what happens is that the control plane of a particular switch, every time there's control plane traffic coming into it that it has to process, um, that gets sent to the control plane or the CPU. 
And so you have to be very concerned about how much traffic is hitting your control plane because it can only process so much just like any other CPU can. So it's important to understand the just in traditional switching and routing and also in our store in storage that we have to understand the difference between the control plane and data plane. We have to understand what type of protocols are being hit to the particular control plane and how much it can process, especially in a data network. It's also important to understand those things from a management standpoint. So how many control planes can I manage um, at one time? In small environments, I might have three traditional storage units, and it's fine for me to do uh, to, to do it the traditional way and manage each control plane separately. Um, but when I start to want to share policy and profiles and different things like that, that's where software-defined storage and software-defined networking starts to come in and say, hey, I have a ton of control planes. How do I make that easier for the user? So how do I make that um, a little bit simpler where I apply policy once or I apply profiles once or I share stuff across control planes? That's where traditional network management tools, storage management tools are there. So that's a long-winded answer, but it's a very important topic to understand. And it's, it, it, make sure you, you spend time understanding how many control planes and data planes and which protocols are talking to the control plane, um, especially in, in networks. That's a huge one that I see every day is where we could have huge broadcast, doma or broadcast domains or huge uh, broadcast storms happening in an environment and it will bring down the control planes of your network devices and become them unusual. Completely agree. Um, one of the things that I've noticed, for example, is that as certain types of topologies and systems get larger, the amount of metadata that's transmitted can easily overcome the actual data. However, when people start to size their environments, they often neglect the metadata impact, focusing only on data transfers. So I, I completely agree that the understanding of how the control plane intersects with various different types of topologies, whether they be a more traditional compute network storage type of environment or a software-defined storage environment, makes a huge impact. Completely agree. Um, well, and, and um, unless any other questions come in, uh, I'm going to go ahead and summarize for what's going on, uh, for what we talked about. So any one of the topics that we talked about today could be, and come to think of it should be, expanded into more thorough examinations like the SMB conversation or NFS conversation, which we could uh, a, a different layered approach uh, for you know, an entire webinar. Our purpose here, though, was to give you a means by which you can actually understand not only the concepts themselves, but how they relate to one another. So, for example, the conversation about fabrics and networks and control plane and data plane and, and even the channels and buses, they all intersect so that you can understand that the context switching becomes considerably more challenging if you don't actually know where you are in the conversation. So when we talk about storage, and we often get caught up in the tribal knowledge of the terms, and as you've seen here, there are times when storage people, like in any technical field, can automatically shift those contexts and leave bystanders out in the cold. So each of these three sections, the channel versus the bus, the control plane versus the data plane, the fabric versus the network, we're designed to help you understand not only what the terms mean, but how they can often be confused with one another. It's not uncommon for people to misuse the, a bus, for example, which is a topology, with a channel, which is a dedicated path that can sit on top of that topology. And one of the most, most often confused terms is fabric, which seems to mean anything that someone wants it to mean at times. So we hope we've managed to clear up some of this, at least from a storage perspective as we talk about how fabrics are a special case of a network. So that's the purpose behind this series. You know, this one, of course, deals with interconnected devices and networks, but we're, there are many more on their way. So if you're looking for information about hosts and storage, for instance, you may want to check out the first in the series, Part Chartreuse. Now the goal of the series for, is for you to be able to pick up whatever topic you want so there aren't any prerequisites for you to have to follow. That's why they're named after colors, by the way, and not numbers. They're all discrete pods that you should be able to pick up without needing a whole bunch of homework. And don't forget to let us know which of these or any others you can think of that you're most interested in. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter so that you don't miss any other announcements for upcoming pods. So after this webcast, um, you'll be able to find uh, the slides and the presentation available for you for download. And uh, as always, we take your feedback and evaluation very seriously. 
and we want you to be able to express your candid feedback. So um, <clears throat> please uh, don't forget to give us a, a ratings of how you appreciated or didn't appreciate certain things that we talked about. Comments, suggestions are always uh, good, um, you know, and especially the constructive ones. So um, in addition, like I said, we're going to be announcing the additional webinars, blogs, and information on our Twitter account. So you can feel free to add us to your collection of Twitter peeps. And once again, on behalf of Dror, Chad, and Fred, I thank you for spending the time with us today. We look forward to seeing you at our next webinar, and we hope that you have a fantastic day. Thank you again.